So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at cislunar infrastructure and the innovations happening uh, in the development there. Our moderator for this panel, here, Ron. Uh, advanced slides, what are we looking at? Oh, yeah. Advanced slides. Um, our moderator for this panel is the Senior Advisor for Space Infrastructure and Logistics at NASA, Debbie Tomek. Debbie has over 23 years of research and technical management experience and began her career at NASA Langley. Debbie has served as a researcher, principal investigator, and then executive of numerous inter- and intra-agency programs. Debbie's early research in dynamic stability was instrumental for numerous space vehicles and led to work on the space shuttle, leading a team that obtained critical re-entry data of the orbiter. Uh, after four years in the administrator suite leading agency technical capability assessments, she returned to Langley as chief of staff before becoming deputy director, then director of the Space Technology Directorate. She shepherded pre-formulation of the National Initiative for On-Orbit Servicing, Assembly, and Manufacturing, OSAM, and this led to her current appointment as NASA Senior Advisor for OSAM and National Initiative Lead. Debbie, over to you. Excellent. Thanks. Ohio and Glenn and, and AAS. So uh, this is always uh, one of my favorite events. So um, I, to get us started, um, I, last year, for those of you that were here, I'm going to kind of uh, pick your brains for those of you who were here, uh, and you've seen it a lot. We've talked a lot about a concept or a principle we developed with our DOD partners called the Space Superhighway. Now, it's not like we're going to go up there and lay asphalt anytime soon, but it's, it's more a concept in which we start thinking about how it is we build out infrastructure from here into cislunar and beyond. Nobody ever wants to talk about infrastructure and logistics, right? It sounds kind of boring, right? But you think of everything we need here terrestrial, right? We're, we're used to being able to refuel. We're used to being able to have power. We're used to going into a hotel and plugging in whatever it is that we need. So you start thinking about the ecosystem that we want to create out in space. Right? We're doing lots in Leo. We've got tons going on there. It's, it's crowded. I, I call it, it's kind of like six-year-old soccer. You know, everybody crowds around the ball in six-year-old soccer. Those of you who have kids that play soccer, you get it, right? So Leo's getting crowded. We've got a lot going on in Geo. But we start thinking about cislunar and beyond. We start thinking about what it is that we need to really build out that ecosystem. I've got my esteemed panelists here that, that are joining me. So we have uh, Ronald Burke. So he is from uh, Aerospace Corporation, and he is leading um, a lot of their cislunar type of uh, architecture work. Had some great discussions with, with Ron of late. We have Kerry Wisnowski, so he is the CEO of Quantum Space, so they're doing some pretty amazing things out there, looking at what it is that we need from a space situational awareness standpoint. And then we've got Michael Zemba, who is representing us uh, from SCAN, NASA SCAN, so my fellow NASA colleague on the other end, um, and he's looking at lunar architecture development. I'm going to let them tell a little bit more about themselves today, and then they also have some slide decks where they're really going to kind of set the stage for what we want to think about as far as innovations in cislunar. How, what is it that we need when we start thinking about that infrastructure and we start thinking about how we want to have a sustainable presence out there, whether it be humans, whether it be R&D out there, whether it be in space manufacturing, whether it be on the surface of the moon. We won't touch so much on that because we have another, another great panel um, coming up after us talking about the actual infrastructure. But I really want you guys to pull deep on your vision and think about, hey, what do we need out there to become sustainable and not Earth dependent anymore, such that we have all the things we're used to here terrestrial. So we have to start thinking about the logistics. We have to start thinking about those pieces of the space superhighway and regional hubs that we need out there that are going to allow us to have power, calm, in space servicing, repair, resilience. And, and one thing I, I, I love and they'll touch on today is I, the, the intersections, the conjunction of the space sectors that we're seeing between civil defense and commercial. So, so much overlap there. Um, I'm seeing a lot of partnerships and, and folks in the community working together like never before. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that today because for us to go to beyond is this lunar and beyond, we're, we're gonna need everybody. And that means us working together um, on this going forward. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and start off then with Ron. He's gonna set the stage for us. So please take some time, tell us a little bit about yourself. Please feel free to brag on the things you're doing and uh, we'll let him talk a little bit about what they're doing in Cislunar. 
All right, thank you, Debbie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly welcome being here with you this morning. Um, and in this discussion, I'll be t speaking uh, from the role that I have with the Aerospace Federally Funded Research and Development Center um, in our development uh, directorate, focusing on the areas of space that look very different through the windshield than they do through the rearview mirror. Um, and cislunar is certainly one, one of those areas. Um, so first, speaking of setting the stage, I uh, want to set the stage of what we're talking about when we're thinking about the domain of the cislunar space. Um, and having uh, gone to the Lion King uh, play over the weekend, you can really appreciate what the value of setting a stage. Um, it's important to recognize that what we're talking about is the area anywhere between um, the Carmen line at 100,000 uh, miles, uh, uh, kilometers rather, out to 550,000 kilometers out past the Earth Moon L2 point, where the majority of the action is. Um, and this includes not only the uh, interspace, but also the surface of the moon, um, although as mentioned, we're really not going to focus too much on the, on the surface specifically. Um, there are many reasons uh, for going to cislunar and for developing the green field of the cislunar domain, um, and I think it's important to recognize that this is a under, as yet, underdeveloped domain. Um, so think about it like an industrial park um, that is really high value, uh, but hasn't been developed yet. Um, there are uh, real drivers in terms of science. We heard questions about uh, the value of, of, of to, to scientists uh, of resources. We've heard about the value of in, uh, in situ resource utilization. Uh, the value of the cislunar domain as a test bed and proving ground. Uh, for going further to Mars, to beyond. Um, uh, while it's not uh, exactly a, uh, a next door uh, in terms of terrestrial space, um, it is next door in terms of interstellar space. Um, it is the closest place that we have to work with. Um, it's important for us to have a presence and for the U.S. leadership, I loved Kelvin's point uh, about the value of U.S. leadership. Um, and it is extremely important that we uh, as a collective, commercial, with government and with our allies, have that, that leadership position and presence is required for, for, for that to happen. So I want to make sure that um, all of that uh, is recognized as being important. And then, of course, we have the value of the security and, and supporting and protecting the assets that we have in this domain. Um, the domain is a wonderfully uh, impressive, and I, I, you know, in a prior panel talked about Congress being interesting. Um, Congress is certainly interesting, uh, but so is the domain of cislunar space and the orbits that um, are available for us to operate in. Um, they're wonderfully eclectic um, in the sense that they are not circular um, as we are used to in terms of uh, LEO kinds of conditions. Uh, they are almost pancake-shaped. Uh, in terms of the areas that are stable uh, and are semi-stable. Um, and there are many different things that we can do in those orbits, uh, including communications, navigation, sensing, um, and even uh, the, the aspects of mobility. And we're going to hear some of that uh, from Michael and, and Kerry. Um, but it is important, I think, to recognize that it is a very different orbital domain. The physics of this domain are quite different than around the Earth. Okay, um, it's a domain that has mutual interests and, and converging interests across the science community, the exploration community, the commercial community, and the security community. Um, and we are definitely on a path, a progression from exploration to commercialization to settlement. Um, and Artemis program, NASA's Artemis program is doing uh, amazing things in terms of advancing our ability, our nation's ability to explore. Um, and the commercial sector is coming on strong, um, as Ellen uh, pointed out. Uh, they are, uh, they, they may have been a bit behind in the starting the race, but they are uh, driving hard and fast uh, to bring capabilities forward. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that the commercial, that, that we're seeing the commercial sector doing. Um, they are uh, <laughs> impressively, we, we started recognizing that there were a very significant number of different companies that were doing different things in terms of preparing for deploying capabilities in the cislunar domain. 
And we started cataloging that, if you will, or building a body of knowledge. And at this point, we are tracking more than 80 companies that are investing north of $2 billion this year in 2023 in one, in a, around 100 different capabilities for one or more of these 12 layers of infrastructure. Um, what we've realized, very much to Debbie's point, is that all, uh, all of these layers of infrastructure are important to a sustainable cislunar ecosystem. Of course, that's what's called for in the National Cislunar Strategy, um, and that's necessary for permanent human presence on the moon, which is called for in the National Space Pol Policy. So there's a lot to be done, um, and there, there is a lot that is being done. Um, a, a, a sort of a lighthearted comment uh, relative to these layers of cislunar infrastructure is you don't have anything until you have everything. And that's an overstatement for sure, um, but it is important to recognize that there are mutual dependencies uh, amongst these different areas and that, that they are all important um, in terms of coming on, coming on, coming on strong. Um, one of the things that we recognize relative to these 12 layers of, of um, infrastructure and the 80 companies, 80 plus companies that are out there, is that they have not had the advantage of a common platform for planning. Um, if you are familiar with city master planning, or I used the industrial park analogy a moment ago, industrial park master planning, uh, you wouldn't imagine that an industrial park would develop by having uh, someone come in and pave a road and then come back and tear it up so you could have somebody come in and put in a water line and then come tear that up and put somebody come back and put in a comms line. Okay, so a little bit of a difficult analogy as Michael will, will clarify, um, but it, it a tortured analogy, uh, but it does recognize that it, there is a value to all of these companies to have a common platform for planning and understanding what each other are doing and understanding their timelines. Um, one of the things that we've recognized in the body of knowledge analysis that we've done is that many of these companies plan to deploy their capabilities by 2028. Um, and so um, they're interdependent. So how one company is doing in their activity um, impacts the other companies in sort of a domino type effect. Um, recently, colleagues of mine and I put together a paper uh, out of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy uh, titled Charting a Course to Cislunar Master Planning, um, and we recognized the value of this role. Uh, we identified a notional construct of a domestic cislunar collaboration council. Uh, that is still yet to be realized, um, but our colleagues at AIAA, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics recognized that they could take a step in that direction, and they did. They've established the Cislunar Ecosystem Task Force. And you see on the screen in front of you the framework, the organizational framework for that task force, and you can see that many of those, uh, many components of that task force have been populated, um, and it was initiated, a soft kind of rollout at Ascend in October, and in the ensuing months, um, a tremendous amount of progress has been made uh, for these uh, parties to come together and begin the process of coordinating their activities. So um, with that, I want to recognize, the, again, the very important role that NASA is playing in all this, um, and the degree to which NASA is increasing its investment in commercial capabilities. In the 90s, they were investing um, on the order of 10 million. Um, and in this decade, uh, the investments are well north of 20 billion. Um, so it's been a very significant increase in the level of investment from NASA for commercial capabilities that are all setting the stage uh, for this domain. From an aerospace standpoint, we're doing everything we can to serve as a backplane uh, to bring together uh, the government community that's involved in cislunar, the commercial community, um, and to recognize the value of the coordination across these parties. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, and I, Ron. I, I might just uh, kind of footstop what you were talking about with the, the master planning. Uh, we, I, I like to think about it, uh, if, 
think about back in the pre-industrial uh, age phase and, and what decisions would we have made then differently if we would have known that we would have been in the position we are now relative to climate and many other different uh, problems that, that we've encountered. And so when you start thinking about that and you start thinking about, okay, as we build out space, how can we start thinking about this in a more integrated and intentional approach to developing it out? That not only gives us that sustainable ecosystem, but also allows us to be intentional in protecting the space environment, whether that be the lunar surface, space, whether it be re-entry vehicles. So I kind of like to call it space urban planning. So I think we all like to call ourselves space urban planners. You guys can join our group if you'd like to. But, uh, but we need efforts like this one to start thinking about how we intentionally do that and coordinate development. So thank you, Ron. Absolutely. All right, Carrie, we will hand off to you. All right, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, give you a quick overview of what we're doing at Quam Space from, from a commercial space standpoint, but more uh, importantly, to engage in some of the Q&A sessions. Um, so before I start, I just want to acknowledge um, Steve Jersik, who's with us today. S Steve uh, was the CEO of Quam Space. We're about two years. The company's been uh, up and running for, and rolling for about two years. Uh, as most of you know, prior to uh, joining Quantum Space, Steve was the uh, Associate Administrator at NASA and the Acting Administrator. Um, I share that because my background is heavily in the national security space, worked for a lot of large aerospace companies and started a company. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to share with you today, the mastermind behind it is Steve, and, and he's been a partner in crime with us and will continue to be one. Um, it's great following Ron because um, what we're planning on developing and um, and putting into space from a quantum space standpoint is simply a, a comprehensive space infrastructure that um, is developed by logistics and data services with the objective of providing secure, safe, and affordable, affordable being a key, access to uh, geo and beyond. Um, the way we developed our business plan and our approach over the last couple of years is a lot of discussions with uh, stakeholders and customers, uh, both uh, on the civilian space side, a lot with NASA and, and, and the community, as well as the national security side. Equally as important with, with people like Ron and the groups that he's chartered and put together that's really helped us get some exposure to what, what are the key uh, 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 innovation and technology needs that are necessary, and where can commercial space provide a significant um, adjunct to what the government's already doing? And we not only worked within uh, our own U.S. Uh, community, but also uh, in the international community, and use that to develop what I'm going to share with you, what we call quantum net. It simply boils down to providing these four uh, facets, which is um, safe, secure, reliable uh, space operations capability, uh, affordable access, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, data services, and what, what type of services are uh, uh, gonna be critical for, uh, for exploration, for science, and for, and, and for uh, continuing exploration. Um, one thing that we've come to appreciate significantly, particularly on the civilian side of the government, is uh, a willingness, uh, and, and when you're in a commercial space business, a willingness is manifest itself in terms of contracts uh, that the government has indicated. We call them market indicators. They're really key to help def define our business plan and how we approach things. But uh, the idea of buying data services is uh, an area that um, the government across the board is moving towards, and, and that's a key part of uh, motivating uh, commercial companies, and not just ourselves, but a lot of the 80 companies that Ron has, has shared with you. And then ability to do flexible operations. Clearly, um, as, as, as Ron was sharing, uh, those of us who, who now play in this volume called Cislunar Space know it's very complex. Uh, the volume is vast. And um, the exploration and science that uh, really the world is looking towards in the future um, 
it's not one shoe size fits all. So having the ability to put spacecraft and, and, and payloads and collect data in different domains of the volume is critically important. Um, I talked a little bit about our comprehensive solution. Uh, I, I, when you look at the, the, the cislunar space and domain, um, from our discussions, again, with both the civilian side and NASA security, uh, one needs a fairly large uh, constellation, probably we call it a fleet of spacecraft to provide the complete capability that's necessary to provide the type of infrastructure. It not, we've done our own studies in this area, multiple organizations, uh, Ron's team and other groups have done this. It's, it's a very vast volume that requires lots of spacecraft to provide digital and physical infrastructure. The services that we plan on providing are uh, along the um, space domain awareness, space situational awareness, depending on what, what vernacular uh, agencies are using. Um, P&T becomes critically important uh, when we've become custom as a society to live, uh, can't live without GPS. Uh, in, in these domains, uh, we need to come up with new solutions. The timing, the distances, all those things require uh, ability to have accurate P and T capability. Um, it, generally, in, there are obviously missions that do a fair amount of deep space exploration. Um, one has to realize the number of people, even in today's world, that are involved in those mission designs and operations. Um, and, and from a commercial standpoint, we have to come up with a better, more effective way of doing that. And, and communication, which which Mike and his team are, are, are leading for NASA, that, that's gonna be a huge part of leveraging that research. Um, orbital, tran orbital transport of uh, spacecraft, and I'll talk about that in a moment, as well as hosting payloads for various customers, that's a key part of our, uh, our, our, our capability as we build out this infrastructure. How we do it is, is a fleet that is modular and builds one after another. Uh, the first one we call Scout. You think of Scout as sort of a sensing vehicle, an Espa Grande or smaller uh, type class of spacecraft. Uh, we're developing uh, some of our early units uh, with electro-optic and visible uh, payloads and looking at RF pay, uh, uh, sensing capability for, for various customers of interest. Uh, interest. Um, our first mission, we're gonna launch uh, in, a, in a, uh, we call Century in, in uh, early 2024. Um, when I mentioned a space, uh, sort of a constellation or a fleet of 40 spacecraft to cover the entire domain, that uh, when we looked at the business case, uh, when we get back to cost affordable, um, it became more advantageous for us to develop what we would call our own orbit transfer vehicle. We call that Ranger. A Ranger is a, uh, a vehicle that can deliver 1,500 kilograms directly to GEO or 2,500 kilograms to Cislunar. And it's a modular platform, and you can see a sort of rendition over there. I have another picture where it's basically going to deliver our scouts into the orbits that we are, that are necessary for us. And we're on track to have that developed in 2025. As the market matures and infrastructure uh, um, uh, highway gets put in place, uh, obviously servicing, refueling, maneuvering is really one of the sort of key areas that uh, is gonna be necessary and we plan on developing a, an outpost uh, later in the decade. Uh, just sharing, um, very quickly, uh, when we talk about the cislunar um, that Ron was sharing, the volume, uh, this mission design is very, very complex. And um, it's probably, this is a, an engineer's version of what's going on, but this just gives you a representation of a mission design that we've been working on, that we have a couple proposals in for customers that are a combination of national security and commercial where we use our Ranger vehicle to deliver a spacecraft 
uh, from a TLI orbit into a, uh, uh, a gravity assist to get into a uh, EML orbit, EML halo orbit, drop off a spacecraft, and then deliver a hosting payload back into GEO and have an extended period of time of operating in the GEO. So that just gives you a representation of the type of missions that are going to be implemented when we talk about the cislunar and commercial space. As we build it out, we'll have these spacecraft that uh, communicate with each other through uh, our relay system that we'll have on our, on our Ranger vehicle and over time build out our, our outpost. And then finally, obviously, as we build this, this quantum net out, uh, there will be plenty of opportunities to provide what I call a test bed. Uh, that's really a big part of what the commercial market is about, is being an early demonstration. Um, the government, uh, as uh, uh, no matter what the size of an organization is, we all have realities of what we prioritize. And we're, we're looking for what we call the sweet spots of areas that we can provide real potential value to both civilian national security and commercial customers. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Welcome. The good thing about going last is these guys covered some of the things I was going to cover already. <laughs> um, so again, I'm Mike Zemba. Uh, I have a number of different roles, but all primarily in service of SCAN, uh, which is NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Office. Um, so I'm the, the lead for Common Nav on the Lunar Architecture Development Team uh, within the Moon to Mars program. And I'm also the principal investigator for a project called Lunar LTE Studies or Lunar Lights, which is developing modeling, simulation, and emulation capability. Um, for communication systems on the surface, I'll leave most of the surface stuff to our, to our next panel, um, but we're developing that to uh, primarily um, have uh, reliable uh, surface propagation models that we can use for comm systems on the lunar surface, uh, with an emphasis on, on 4G and 5G, which we think are, are key pieces of infrastructure for the future. Um, so it's the last day. I thought I would have a little fun and turn my title slide into uh, a bit of a pop quiz. <laughs> so uh, obviously this is the lunar surface, right? And again, sorry, pop surface quiz panel. for us or the audience? <laughs> for everyone. Um, right, everybody get ready. So the question is, uh, can anyone identify this feature? This is a picture from Apollo. Um, it's from one of the EVAs. Does anyone recognize that hill and or mountain? No guesses? Uh, I know it's the largest mountain, right? Close, yeah, Mons Hadley. Um, so that's Mons Hadley. Uh, from this perspective, it's over 20 kilometers away, and it is 4.5 kilometers tall. Um, so as Debbie mentioned, that makes it the second tallest mountain on the moon. Um, and to, to compare it to something uh, you, you may have seen, I haven't seen in person, but to, to give it some terrestrial reference, uh, that is taller than K2. So it's, it's taller um, than a lot of the mountains on Earth, and it's, it's not necessarily apparent from looking at that, right? Um, the, the reason I wanted to include that was to just kind of emphasize that our intuition isn't great when it comes to operating on the moon. Everything is different, um, and we need the re reliable infrastructure to support us uh, while we're operating in that environment. Um, there's a famous anecdote from the mission right before this, Apollo 14, uh, where the crew went out on EVA um, Part of their mission was to go visit a crater called Cone Crater, very large crater near the landing site. They went out, um, hiked around for a while, and they couldn't find it. Um, so ultimately, after the mission, from analysis of boulder placement and things, they determined that they probably were within 20 to 30 meters of the rim, uh, but they ended up not being able to identify it because of um, just the very alien landscape of the lunar environment. Uh, so just to emphasize that navigation is very important. Lunar GPS would be great. Um, having reliable comm back to Earth to make sure uh, mission control can say, you know, if you can't find the crater, it's time to turn around. Um, Got to make sure you maintain your safety margins with your, uh, with your life support systems. So uh, my agenda, I was going to talk about the definition of cislunar space a little bit. I'll just breeze over that since Ron gave us such a great introduction. Um, there's a couple things I want to mention. And then I'm going to highlight the rapid increase in lunar missions that we're currently in the midst of, uh, and then specifically talk about communications infrastructure from a cislunar perspective, 
and our roadmap to how we develop that cislinear communi communications infrastructure that we need. And then lastly, this is the Glenn Symposium after all. So I'll highlight a little bit of how Glenn Research Center is supporting some of those cislinear infrastructure innovations. So this is my chart on uh, cislunar space. Um, as Ron mentioned, uh, cislunar space goes out to, it, it's a very vague term, right? So literally it just means this side of the moon. So generally um, it's between here and the moon's orbit. Um, so technically we are all in cislunar space right now. <laughs> but uh, realistically it's not a great definition because you know we want to include the Lagrange points and L2 by the laws of physics is on the other side of the moon's orbit. Um, there's also transfer orbits that can go outside the moon's orbit. So in general cislunar space is a little bit um, wider than the moon's orbit the way that it's generally used. Um, one of the things I did want to mention, uh, I did some, some napkin math to try and put that in context a little bit. So if we say that cislunar space is at least, uh, let's say, 500,000 kilometers out. So the moon's orbit at its maximum, it varies in, in distance from Earth, but generally 400,000 kilometers uh, at the maximum. Um, and then go a little bit farther for L2, which I think is about 60 some thousand, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we'll round that up to 500,000. Uh, if you imagine a sphere of half a million kilometers around the Earth, that volume, um, to compare it to the size of Jupiter and the volume of Jupiter, you could fit Jupiter into that volume of cislunar space at least 350 times. Again, depending on, on how, vague, you know, how, how you define the radius, but um, it's a very, very large space to be operating in, um, and it's very different uh, than operating, say, in, in LEO or GEO, um, and we need the infrastructure to be able to support that. So this is my chart to highlight the absolutely massive uh, increase in lunar missions and uh, missions to cislunar space that we are currently in the midst of. Uh, so this is a timeline of um, not all missions, but all successful soft touchdowns on the lunar surface, just to down select a little bit. Um, I didn't want to make the chart too unreadable. So uh, starting from the 1960s to today and then going out a little bit into the future, this is every time a spacecraft has successfully touched down on the lunar surface. So that's all of NASA's robotic surveyor uh, missions, all of Apollo, um, all of the Soviet Luna missions uh, during the space race, and then a, a big gap of almost 50 years, uh, and most recently the Chinese Chang'e missions, um, which have been the only three missions to successfully touch down uh, in almost 50 years. Uh, obviously, um, you know, many of you know we've had uh, a few, uh, we not, NASA necessarily, I'm speaking in the general human, <laughs> humankind space exploration sense. Um, there's been a few high profile and, and tragic uh, landing, uh, failed landing attempts um, with uh, Vikram and Bereshit both in 2019 uh, and then most recently the Hokuto R just earlier this year. Um, but all told, in, in terms of successful landings, there's been 21 throughout all of human history. Uh, and if you look, uh, that big cloud of gray missions uh, on the right of the chart there, that's everything, oh, not even everything, it's a, a sampling of missions that are coming up. Uh, and there's over 21 there. So we are expecting more missions in the next five years than have ever successfully landed on the lunar surface. Again, that's not orbiters or impactors, it's just successful soft touchdowns. Um, but that's a lot of need for infrastructure, right? Um, I'll skip over this one. This is just kind of highlighting uh, some of the upcoming missions, but obviously we're very excited about a lot of these uh, CLIPS missions starting to take off, um, seeing our Intuitive Machines partners and Astrobotics partners um, get some, some science data back from the surface. So uh, to talk actually about the communications infrastructure, um, so again, this is a, a timeline. I guess I like timelines, but uh, uh, on the top there, we've got calendar year and the associated Artemis missions as currently manifested. Uh, and then it might be a little bit hard to read, but in green on the top are the uh, campaign segments um, associated with the, the Moon to Mars program. Um, so over the next few years for Artemis two and Artemis three, uh, and then taking us into Artemis 4 and Artemis 5, we're in that human lunar return segment where we're getting back to the moon, um, demonstrating our, our landing systems and things. Uh, as we move forward and we start to get more uh, infrastructure in place, um, we are moving into the foundational exploration phase of the architecture. And then um, once we have a, a fairly robust infrastructure, uh, we're talking sustained lunar evolution, very long duration stays on the surface. Um, and uh, obviously a lot of infrastructure needed to support all that activity. So um, 
roughly associated with those same campaign segments, but a little bit different. Um, this is the current uh, scan uh, notional uh, plan for developing communications and navigation architecture over that time period out to early 2030s, about Artemis 9 or so. Uh, so we've got an initial phase, right, which corresponds to about Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. What do we need in place as soon as possible uh, to make sure we can support landing on the surface? We've got a growth phase, which is where we're really starting to develop capability uh, and getting us to a place where we're ready for a, a, a long-term sustained presence. And then we've got that desired future state, which is that long-term vision, right? And, and what do we need ultimately to be able to support sustained human exploration on the lunar surface? So some of the, the aspects in terms of COM for the initial phase, um, obviously we need uh, direct to Earth service. I'm gonna use a lot of COM terminology, so I apologize if I use an acronym and forget to uh, explain it. Uh, but DTE is direct to Earth service. So we've got DTE from the near side, uh, both for lunar orbiters and for surface missions. Uh, there's gonna be a large increase in data rates and data volumes uh, immediately relative to, to what you're, we're used to without any lunar exploration uh, at the moment. Um, and we've got, uh, for that early phase even, we need intense relay service for the South Pole and a select area over the far side, as well as initial PNT service and uh, initial lunar surface networking near vehicles. Um, the other thing we wanna make sure we have in place from the start is strong interoperability standards. And that's something that SCAN is currently pursuing through the uh, lunar net, Luna Net specification. As we move into the growth phase, um, you know, we continue GTE service for the near side, obviously, but we start to expand that relay service for the South Pole. We start to add multiple far side regions. Uh, we've got limited relay service for other globally dispersed locations around the moon, as well as for orbiters. And we start uh, to implement a lunar navigation service. So basically, uh, GPS for the moon. Um, as I mentioned with that Apollo anecdote, uh, very important to know where you are, uh, how to get back to your habitat or your lander. Uh, and we also expand surface networking capability by leveraging new elements such as LTV as they come online uh, and start to introduce optical links, which if you're not familiar are, are very important for being able to pipe a lot of data over a link uh, and make sure that as more and more missions are active on the surface, we can handle that absolutely insane amount of data that's coming back. Uh, lastly, for the desired future state, and you know, future meaning the next 10 years or so, uh, we've got satellite constellations with multiple operators uh, functioning as a cooperative set of networks, intense coverage of specific regions and regular coverage of all regions globally around the moon. Those optical trunk link lines are now uh, in place regularly to bring data back, uh, and we've got continued growth of service network capability uh, as new elements are delivered, such as uh, pressurized rover or uh, surface habitat. So it's it's easy uh, if we say cislunar infrastructure to think about what's out in space, right? What is in orbit around the moon? What's helping to bring our data back? Uh, but especially from a communications perspective, it's important to remember that cislunar infrastructure starts here in the cislunar space that we're all sitting in right now, right? Um, all that data has to come back to the ground. Uh, everything needs to phone home. And uh, for the number of missions that are coming up, uh, it's, it's a lot of data and a lot of links that need to happen. Um, so that ground station support on Earth is really critical uh, to developing our cislunar common nav infrastructure. So this is uh, an example of a few of the um, planned links back to Earth around the Artemis V timeframe. Um, obviously, NASA has great assets uh, in terms of the deep space network and the near space network, uh, but it's, it's not enough to cover everything that we need to do, right? So we need to lean on our international partners, um, ESA, uh, where we're able to coordinate with them. Uh, and we're also, uh, as we've heard in some of the other earlier sessions on policy and things, very much leaning into these commercial partnerships. Um, so relying on HLS providers to use their own ground stations, relying on potential relay providers who are likely to be commercial to also use their own ground stations. Uh, and that's a similar thing to what we're seeing with the, the ESA Moonlight program, which is uh, another um, lunar relay program that ESA is pursuing in, in partnership with their uh, European industry. So if that's what we need, uh, how do we get there from today? Uh, so SCAN has referred to it as the four point plan, uh, very simple in, in, in principle, right? Um, and those four points are uh, upgrading our DSN, um, adding a legs subnet to our near space network, which is a 
subnet of uh, 18 meter dishes entirely dedicated just to lunar exploration, uh, emphasizing lunar relay capability and interoperable lunar networks as well as surface networking, and then forging international partnerships and contributions. So just to elaborate on each of those a little bit, the, the upgrades to the 34 meter antennas at the DSN, um, the plan is, and this is currently in progress, so you know these are not long term necessarily uh, goals. These are things we're doing now to meet that long-term vision. So the, the DSN is upgrading two antennas at each of the three DSN complexes. So six antennas altogether that will add simultaneous operations capability at each of those, which allows us to um, have two links at a time, either S and KA band frequencies or X and KA band or simultaneous KA band. Uh, and that will increase our data rates uh, as well up to uh, greater than 100 megabits per second downlink in KA band. The LEGS 18-meter uh, subnet development, uh, like I mentioned, is an entirely new subnet of the Near Space Network. Uh, those will be 18-meter class dishes, and the intent is to have at least three of them globally dispersed the same way the DSN sites are uh, to make sure that we maintain continuous coverage no matter where the Earth is in its rotation. Uh, NASA is currently pursuing the build of those first three leg sites uh, with the intent to uh, lean into commercial services to add additional capacity uh, as well as redundancy. In terms of lunar relay and interoperable lunar networks, again, those the relays are critical to remove that direct Earth line of sight component. Um, as most of us know, Artemis is focused on exploring the South Pole region of the moon. And from the South Pole, the Earth is visible half the time at best, just due to the orbital geometry. Um, so you're not doing any better than half the half the you know half the month, uh, depending on uh, direct to Earth line of sight. So relays alleviate that line of sight burden uh, and also reduces our our user burden. A, a smaller class user can communicate with a relay to get back to Earth, but we're still limited uh, in terms of the number of links we can support at any given time. Right. So another important piece of that is surface networking to be able to aggregate all that data together, combine it into one high throughput link, and pipe it back to Earth. And lastly, our, our international partnerships, of course, um, as emphasized through the, the Artemis Accords and all our, our great international partners who are excited about going back to the moon with us. Um, you know, SCAN is, is leveraging that as well and currently seeking contributions from our partners for both Earth-based and lunar common nav assets. Uh, in terms of priority, uh, priority one is direct Earth assets that meet or exceed the legs performance, the 18-meter class dishes you see in the picture there. Uh, lunar common relay and PNT services is priority two, and priority three is lunar surface common PNT capabilities. So lastly, um, I don't know, on the tour yesterday, did anybody get to see the ACF? If not, here's a picture of it, <laughs> so you can see it now. Um, or a render, sorry, it's not a picture. Uh, so here's a few of the facilities that we have at Glenn um, that are coming online as we speak. Um, they were literally gluing up an uh, absorber in the range yesterday. So uh, these are coming online to support all of this lunar infrastructure development. Um, so in this big uh, range on the left here, uh, we have a 10 meter class planar near field range. So that means we can test anything up to 10 meters. Uh, that actually allows us to test antennas installed on vehicles, right? Potentially, if you have a rover, as long as it's smaller than 10 meters, we could potentially just drive it right into the range and, and test performance of the antenna as it's installed. Um, We've also got a compact antenna test range, which will also be in that uh, range facility, the big cube, uh, that will allow us to test higher frequency and larger aperture antennas uh, within a reasonable footprint. And I should mention that both of those uh, in that cube section of the facility uh, that was specifically designed with RF absorbing concrete that actually provides uh, up to 100 dB of attenuation before we install any of the absorber for the range. Um, so it's very, very quiet in terms of electromagnetic interference uh, and also you know, very, very private if you're worried about anybody snooping on what you're doing in there. Not, not that we are, but maybe somebody is. <laughs> so uh, we also have a cylindrical and spherical near field range, um, not in that part of the facility, but more towards the center. Um, it's a, a hybrid cylindrical spherical range, uh, also in a shielded room, um, but more central to the facility. Um, we're installing in September, uh, a 3.7 meter fast tracking ground station that will be fast enough to track LEOs as they fly by overhead. Uh, and it's also fairly unique in terms of capability. So it'll have S band and KA band uh, frequencies. Um, and in terms of KA band, it's the, the wide range of commercial uh, government and military allocations. Uh, but it's also specifically designed to have um, inverted 
uh, uplink and downlink capability as well, uh, which allows us to synthesize a lunar user. So for example, uh, if uh, your fancy new uh, lunar relay is going up into orbit uh, and you want to test out your lunar communication systems, uh, this ground station can act as a lunar user uh, for on-orbit checkout. Uh, we're also developing uh, advanced hardware in the loop emulation. This one is near and dear to my heart as the PI for lunar lights. Um, that will allow us to realistically emulate propagation across the lunar surface, both for surface to surface links, as well as those low elevation angle direct to earth links that are grazing across the horizon as the signal propagates back to earth. Uh, we've got RF characterization of materials, uh, and we're presently uh, utilizing that to characterize lunar regolith simulants um, that are as chemically representative of the lunar surface as possible to feed back into our surface propagation modeling. Uh, and we have a great team of folks working on optical communications development to fill out that piece of the architecture, uh, which, as I mentioned, is going to be very important for high data rate trunk lengths back to Earth. And that's all I got. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. That was, uh, I, I hope that gave uh, all of you a glimpse at, at the innovations that are occurring. And of course, they're not, uh, it's not just these, it's many more. I, but I, I can't get out of my head, Michael, the 350 350 Jupiters. Jupiters and, and there's no pressure on any of us, right, uh, relative to covering that that's a, space. That's I, a low estimate, too, because I yeah. used 500,000 kilometers and Ron said 550. Right, right. <laughs> but getting SSA out there and getting COM and PNT, we've got our work cut out for us. But also, I look at the cadence of the lunar missions coming up, and, and what an exciting time. I, I kind of want to hit rewind and be coming out of college right now. So those of you that are students here, um, it's going to really be uh, sporty in a good way. Uh, I'm looking forward to this decade and the next as we go forward. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I want to make sure we've got enough time for our, our online and our audience here to ask questions. I will save our prepped questions uh, for after if we still have time. So are there any audience questions uh, that or online? We'll jump to those. I had a question. Um, seeing as we are in a sort of critical point when it comes to cislunar applications and missions sent uh, to the moon, um, with so many missions uh, on the horizon and with so many contributors to all of this hardware and all these applications, um, just on a national basis, not even including international or potentially non-cooperative partners, how do you ensure uh, as you were mentioning, the LunaNet interoperability, how do you ensure and account for uh, all of these applications moving forward, um, the interoperability between them and the integration between them? And then I guess as a follow-up to that, do you believe there's an opportunity for a digital network, a digital model of all of these components interconnected, and how can that be used to, to benefit us as we are entering into a time where we have a lot of applications in uh, cis lunar space? Yeah, that's a great question. Should I take that one? Yes, <laughs> okay. Michael, jump in. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, uh, yeah. with the, the LunaNet spec, uh, it's very important to get ahead of it, right, and make sure we um, are defining that interoperability as early as possible. Um, but that's, that's uh, you know, a great point as well about the on-the-ground testing, interoperability testing, um, having uh, both digital twins as well as emulation environments to make sure that before something flies, we can hook it up in an emulation environment, um, you know, test its interaction with other commercial relays, with NASA ground stations, uh, make sure everything plays nice together, uh, and, you know, be confident in that before we send it up to orbit. And if I can just expand on that, I um, completely agree. And what a, what a great and prescient um, question. I think I, that was a plant. <laughs> it's such a good it, question. It felt like a plant. <laughs> it, it did. Um, you know, one of the things that's um, going to be important is that there is a digital engineering ecosystem-like environment. Um, you know, we've used some of that language here. I'm not sure if that's familiar to all of the audience. But essentially, a digital environment that accurately represents not only the capabilities, the systems, but the systems operating in their operating environment um, is, is the dig digital engineering ecosystem construct. And having that and having that available to all of the participants. 
right? So that um, if someone has a particular capability that, for instance, in situ resource, uh, resource utilization um, system, uh, that they m are able to verify that they can actually draw power from multiple power sources or a multiple or, or a power grid, as was discussed yesterday, and that they have the ability to um, communicate through more than one communications network or through a network that itself is interoperable, to, to Michael's point. Um, and so we, we, the collective community, need two things. We need some sort of a, a master planning platform, some place where everybody can come together, um, and hopefully the AIAA uh, Cislunar Ecosystem Task Force at least lends a hand in that direction, st a stepping stone in that direction. Um, and we need some form of an, a common um, engineering ecosystem environment, digital engineering ecosystem environment to operate in, where individual players can come in, do their sandbox operations. I love your test bed um, capabilities, right? And Me do too. testing and so forth. And then be, you know, be in a position to build that confidence and share that confidence uh, with other players in the game. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, all right. Anybody else uh, question? <clears throat> question, I probably, Mike, simple question, maybe not a simple answer. Who regulates the spectrum for cislunar activities? Um, it's a complicated question, for sure. <laughs> uh, but um, NASA has a spectrum office uh, within the Space Communication and Navigation Office. Um, and for uh, worldwide coordination, that goes to the International Telecommunications Union, um, which is uh, a sub-agency of the United Nations. Right. So it's a, it's a very long process uh, that we're, we're currently involved in to make sure we have the spectrum when we need it. Go ahead. Um, so my question is kind of thinking about how there's so many different kinds of communications that not just NASA and SCAN is developing with, you know, quantum communications, lunar lights, um, the high rate delay tolerant networking, even like the optical comms and stuff like that. How does all of that fit into the cislunar structure and kind of why have so many different kinds instead of just like developing one or another? Yeah. Um, so each has a, a specific utility, right? Um, so optical comm is great for uh, high data rate communications, but uh, the, the power uh, and thermal constraints could be limiting depending on the class of mission. Um, the, you know, if you're operating on the lunar surface, dust could be a, a huge constraint for optical comm. Um, so each, you know, each piece has a, a role to play, right? And it's a, a balancing act between making sure that you have everything working together to, uh, to provide a, a, a full cislunar infrastructure that, that supports everything you want to do. Uh, thanks. This, this has been a, a really excellent discussion, so I, I thank all of you for these contributions. Thank I have you. really two questions. One hopefully is pretty easy, and the, the second one is probably pretty hard. Uh, the first one is how much of this capability is going to be in place uh, by the time Artemis III happens? You know, what kind of communication capability are we going to have enhanced by the time that occurs? And, and so that I can sit down while you answer, I'll give you my second question. Um, so probably never since the uh, origination of the internet has there been a bigger playground for humanity to evolve <laughs> than, the, than what you're talking about here. Uh, and I think, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to like wonder what, what how, how could we function without this economy in cis lunar space? not being here like we now think of the beginning of the internet. But unfortunately, along with that playground comes a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity for bad actors. And so I, I guess if you can talk a little bit about, you know, the security aspects of, of all of these capabilities and how we're going to protect against people, you know, messing with all of this stuff and using it badly. So thank you. Thank That's you. the first part. I'll take a second. Sure. Uh, yeah, the first part's the easy one, I think. <laughs> uh, so by Artemis III, um, the intent for SCAN is to have at least one and ideally two relays in place through a commercial service uh, to be able to support uh, South Pole and limited far side operations. Will, will we have, you know, HDTV, you know, when they... We'd love to, right? We want the, the yeah. nice pictures that coming back. Yes uh, or no. Like, 4K. I mean, are we going to have that? Or... <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We will. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. All right, and, and a brief response to the second on security. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, heard from the U.S. Space Force, uh, and General Raymond has, has conveyed that they will adjust and, and, and um, address security for protecting U.S. interest in cislunar assets um, as they are needed over time. Uh, it's a very nice article in Space News uh, that quotes General Raymond uh, on, that, on that topic. Great, thank Ch you. Shout out to Space News. Thank you. I might uh, pose a question uh, to Carrie for you before we wrap up here and swing it kind of back to the commercial side for a moment if I can. I, there's been a lot of discussion of late that, that we're not moving quick enough, we're not doing enough. And, and there's also discussion that uh, there's a lot of capital sitting around uh, waiting uh, to be leveraged, but companies are, are chasing after what they think is going to get funded. So if we start thinking about all of these, this infrastructure that we need beyond to, to, to meet the, this ecosystem and what he's talking about and all of us have discussed, I mean, what do you think is that spark that's going to open up this market beyond geo? I mean, what, what is it? You know, we've got to talk more what's going to close the business case, right? Yeah. What's going to generate the profit for commercials? So what, what do you think that spark is? So... I think I heard three questions all in one, so I'm going to try to take them one. The, the, the first is that there's capital that's out there just sitting on the sidelines waiting to be deployed. Um, th that probably was true a few years back. Um, one has to put in the context of what Ron was sharing is that there's, there's 80 commercial companies that are that are out there um, that at some level have have been uh, 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 relying, benefiting, developing their plans based on capital, right? And so one thing I've come to appreciate is um, there's different types of capital. There's venture capital investments, and there's private equity investments, and 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 the, and there's your you know, government investments for that matter. And they all have different criteria. And um, one thing I've come to realize is that um, the, the capital that one might interpret that people are sitting on or organizations are, um, when, when investors or firms, when they invest in businesses like ours, um, they, they all keep some type of reserve to, they want us to succeed just like we want to succeed. And so what you're seeing that's going on in the market with higher interest rates and the ability that, that the money that the organizations generally have, they're being smarter and, and, and they want to use it to see their companies continue to succeed. And, and there's not been many exits in, in, of liquidation of companies into the public market that we saw three or four years ago. So I, while it still may be out there, I think the general view of it is that it's... Um, it's going to be deployed for the businesses that are going to be successful. And, and then to the point about businesses are tailoring or, or scaling their business plan based to be on, on the idea of being um, uh, con uh, contracts or funding. Um, if, if you're in the business, I can speak from quantum space, if, or anybody that's in this room, if you're an executive and you're associated on the government side or a firm or an investor or in a company associated with uh, Cislinder Space, you probably have a high likelihood of probability that you believe it's humanity's destiny, the journey to the stars, right? That we're going to continue to explore, to expand. And so, so to do that, you have to have vision. And we put it in the context of BMP. So like most of us think of BMP as bid and proposal, right? Whether you're in the industry or government, there's BMP. But to us, BMP is being bold in terms of your plan, but being prudent of how you, how you uh, uh, execute your, your, your business plan. And so I think in that context, um, investors, they do want to see innovation. They want us, they want us uh, the government wants to see demonstrable progress. Right. And so I think what goes on is businesses try to balance. How do you demonstrate innovation and make marketable progress? And then I think about your third comment or question about the spark. 
I've, I've thought about that even before you brought it up. And I think there's two sparks that uh, might let the genie out of the bottle, if, if people remember those days. Um, that means you're, all your dreams come true, right? I think the two uh, paths to let the genie out of the bottle, one is if you think about what we were talking about earlier, uh, a short uh, cost affordable or short access to space, we think about Leo, people don't even flinch their, you know, don't even blink when, when something gets launched in Leo. And it was brought up in one of the questions here. The, we don't even know what were the markets in, that are going to be developed once the cislunar domain gets, get infrastructure gets put in place. But we've still got to make it more cost affordable because out of those 80 companies, there's, there's a, a subset of them that really will have the capital and the ability with contracts to be able to get and demonstrate in Cislunar. That's still a, a burden to entry. So one, one way, and it was just brought up here a moment ago, um, reducing the cost to, to entry into the Cislunar space, I think is making it a, a reliable. The other one is um, what may happen in the political environment. If you think about, uh, we're just talking about on the NASA security side, by definition, we have to maintain our leadership in space, right? That's what the United States, that's what we're all about here. And so um, as other countries uh, explore and demonstrate capability, um, one could easily envision a discrete event that causes, uh, you know, wakes up the, the national security to really uh, say, we have to really move in that area and when they do, you'll see industry quickly follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's probably a long-winded answer, but I no, no, to that. it was an excellent answer. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, and thank you to yeah. the panelists. Yeah. I think we have run a little bit over, so we will hand it off back to you. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate the great questions and your time. Thank you. Thank you.